Tonight, North Korea's young leader Kim Jong-un is re-elected as the regime's head as the rubber stamp parliament opens a session that is expected to endorse personnel reshuffles. In the wake of the eye-opening discoveries of three suspected North Korean drones, South Korea is pushing to buy about 10 low-altitude radars from Israel to better counter security threats. Plus, diplomatic efforts to de-escalate the situation in Ukraine are underway. The U.S., the EU, Russia and Ukraine will hold ministerial talks for the first time next week. But these stories and more next on Arirang News at 8. Good evening and thank you for joining us. It's Wednesday, April 9th here in Seoul. I am Yu Ji-hae. We begin this evening in North Korea where the regime is holding its new parliamentary session on this Wednesday as the convention is largely expected to serve as a chance to name new commission members. All eyes are on the event as the world could get a glimpse of the isolated state's policies and power structure. Arirang News' Hwang Sung-hee reports. North Korea's 13th Spring People's Assembly session got underway in Pyongyang on Wednesday. It marks the first session of the rubber stamp parliament elected under Kim Jong-un's leadership. As widely expected, the young Kim was represented as the chairman of the powerful National Defense Commission, according to the state-run Korean Central News Agency. Other agenda items at the meeting include appointing officials for government posts and deliberating on this year's budget plan. The first session of the country's highest legislative body is an occasion to find out who's in and who's out of North Korea's ruling circle. And speculation is that a major reshuffle could be in the works. Sources say Prime Minister Park bong ju the country's economic policymaker, could be sacked to take responsibility for failed economic reform plans. 86-year-old figurehead President Kim Young-nam may step down after 15 years in office. Possible successors to the positions include Kim Yang-gun, top policymaker in charge of inter-Korean matters, and Vice Premier Kang Seok-ju. The meeting comes as North Korea has been raising tensions on the Korean peninsula with a series of missile launches, artillery shellings, and threats to conduct another nuclear test. All eyes are on what kind of a message the regime will send to South Korea and the United States. Hwang Sung-hee, Arirang News. And over now to the latest out of the trilateral talks on North Korea's nuclear program. The speculation is high that South Korea, the U.S. and Japan may be ready to be a bit more flexible in their dealings with the North. Our Chiu Sun has more. South Korea, the U.S. and Japan are considering scaling back the preconditions they want met before resuming talks with North Korea over its nuclear program. Following a meeting of the three countries' nuclear negotiators this week, a South Korean official told reporters in Washington that they're looking at a variety of ways to resume talks with Pyongyang. The official said the three parties are looking at the conditions with a little more flexibility in mind and that the ways in which North Korea shows sincerity about giving up its nuclear weapons program could be up for discussion. The three nations, together with China and Russia, have been trying to denuclearize the North under the six-party framework for more than a decade. But the six-party talks have been suspended since late 2008 because of repeated provocations by Pyongyang. In return for U.S. food aid two years ago, North Korea agreed to suspend its missile and nuclear testing, place a moratorium on its uranium enrichment, and allow international inspectors into its nuclear facilities. Washington and its two main Asian allies have been demanding Pyongyang take additional actions outside of the food for denuclearization framework before returning to negotiations. The official, however, said there's a need for further review and discussions with China, another key six-party member. He then said what's most important is stopping the enhancement of North Korea's nuclear and missile capabilities and for the North to leave room for negotiations without carrying out further provocations. Experts in Seoul, however, caution that it's too soon to jump to any conclusions about a change in South Korea's position. 
Instead, they say this could merely be another message urging Pyongyang to act sincerely and return to the negotiating table. Choi Yusun, Arirang News. South Korea is wasting little time bolstering its air surveillance system after discovering three probable North Korean drones on its territory in recent weeks. So it wants to buy some seriously advanced radar systems from Israel that could help detect any unwanted visitors in the sky. Hwang Ji-hae reports. The discoveries of three suspected North Korean drones in less than a month on South Korean soil has prompted Seoul to take action. The government said Wednesday that it would be adopting Israel's tactical air surveillance radar system. A government source said an emergency budget of around 19 million U.S. dollars will be drawn up to purchase 10 low-altitude RPS-42 radars and other surveillance equipment this year. They will be deployed at key government facilities, including the presidential office and on the West Coast next year. South Korea's current radars are not capable of detecting the North's small-sized drones, but the newly adopted Israeli system is. It can detect all types of aerial objects as small as half a meter in size within a 30-kilometer radius and has an altitude range of 10 kilometers. The South Korea military has been under fire for allowing the unmanned aerial vehicles to infiltrate its airspace, which represents a national security threat. In another effort to boost the nation's military readiness, Korea has asked the U.S. Defense Security Cooperation Agency to purchase more than 100 advanced missiles. The agency said Tuesday that it had notified Congress of a possible sale of missiles, equipment and parts to Seoul. South Korea plans to buy 76 Sidewinder Block II missiles and 32 captive air training missiles at a cost of nearly $100 million to help counter threats from North Korea. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Amid heightened concerns over South Korea's air defense capacity, Seoul's defense minister was grilled at the Parliamentary Defense Committee meeting and he had a lot of explaining to do. Here's Arirang News' political correspondent, Ji Myung Gil, with the details. Parliamentary Defense Committee lawmakers gathered Wednesday to hear what measures the Defense Ministry has drawn up to counter the threat of North Koreans' unmanned aerial vehicles. We are worried that the drones may have attack capabilities, that they may even be loaded with nuclear warheads. What measures have you prepared? The suspected North Korean drones do not have the ability to strike targets. They can't be used for acts of terror. But we will quickly reinforce our defenses to better detect and defuse any enemy assets. Part of the plan's defense chief Kim Guanjin laid out include buying advanced low-altitude surveillance radars and anti-aircraft guns. The government is also mulling over providing financial rewards to anyone who reports spotting a drone. But lawmakers also wanted to know why the defense ministry wasn't prepared for an infiltration of small-sized drones in the first place. Small North Korean drones have been flying around the front borderline since seven or eight years ago. Don't you think we've neglected this fact? We've been preparing for drone threats since the early 1990s, but we had prepared for small drones that are more than five meters in length. We hadn't received reports of drones smaller than two meters. During the meeting, lawmakers urged the defense ministry to not just rely on the purchase of low-altitude surveillance radars from Israel, but to also launch a colossal revamp of the country's air defense system. As for the North Korean threat of a fourth nuclear test, defense ministry officials said they were monitoring developments at the North Pungeri nuclear site and would work with the UN to impose harsher sanctions in the event a test is carried out. Kim young Arirang News. For the latest in news that impacts Korea and the world, join Yu ji for a lively half hour that covers politics, business, international news, and much more. Live at 8 every weeknight on Arirang TV. Move in, but fostering startups is part of the government's three-year economy. 
The Korea's March job figures are out, and the market seems to be picking up steam. Statistics Korea said Wednesday that the jobless rate in the nation dropped last month to 3.9 percent from the 4.5 percent recorded in February. The total number of employed people in Korea stood at over 25 million, which is an increase of 650,000 from the same month last year. The agency attributed the rise to a steady economic recovery after a long-term slump. Job creation did, however, slow from the previous month's 835,000 gain. That was the largest on-year job growth since March 2002. The Korean consumers are turning more and more to the Internet to purchase products from abroad, and understandably so, as they can get much better deals. To keep more of that money in the country, the government is stepping in. As Hong ji reports. Import prices of these products are around $10, but the very same product on the shelf of a department store carries a price tag four times higher. That's the case with many imported products, after distribution margins and marketing prices are taken into account. To provide consumers with sufficient information and to stabilize prices, the government has added the import prices of 10 industrial products, like wine, strollers and lipstick to its publicly available list. The import price list previously included 60 food products. The customs office said the cheaper the import price of an item, the more expensive its retail price became, as a monopoly among domestic distributors meant no price competitiveness. This gap between the import and retail prices has led more and more Korean consumers to directly purchase products from overseas over the years, mostly online. Direct overseas shopping tripled from 2010 to a billion U.S. dollars last year. The beefed-up import price list is only one change the government is making to support consumers. At an economic ministerial meeting on Wednesday, Finance Minister Hyun woo announced that the customs clearance process would be sped up to allow consumers to claim their purchased items more quickly. They will also be able to return their products purchased overseas with less fuss and get tax refunds more easily thanks to simplified procedures. The government will also encourage free market competition among importers by facilitating parallel imports, all part of its goal to lower the retail prices of imported consumer goods by up to 20 percent over the next three years. Song ji Arirang News. Microsoft Korea says it will extend the line of credit to governmental and public institutions so they can upgrade their computer system to the latest version of Windows. This after the U.S.-based software giant pulled the plug on free support and updates for Windows XP. The move comes as some of Korea's public organizations, which have a track record of being hacked, continue to use the 13-year-old operating system due to their limited budgets. The grace period would allow the institutions to upgrade their OS now and pay for it next year. Meanwhile, the government says it's closely monitoring the situation and will offer free software vaccines to keep XP users secure. But since its creation back in 1989, the World Wide Web has changed the way we interact, the way we work, and the way we live. That the future of the web is being discussed by some of the greatest minds in the field in Seoul this week at an international conference. Our Kim ji was there. The 23rd Annual International World Wide Web Conference 2014 opened in Seoul on Wednesday. The conference provides the world with a forum to discuss the development of the web, the standardization of its associated technologies, and its impact on society and culture. At this year's conference, co-hosted by KAIS and the Korean Agency for Technology and Standards, experts from a variety of web-related fields address what roles the web plays and what opportunities and challenges lie ahead. Tim Berners-Lee, who first conceived of the World Wide Web in 1989, was among one of the foreign panelists that discussed what to expect over the next 25 years. Berners-Lee is part of a movement called The Web We Want that argues for law and order or a bill of rights of sorts for online freedom and impartiality. He said the openness of the web is currently under threat by big governments and conglomerates worldwide. And people and we all start taking the web more for granted. Then there will be uh, there will be other things that maybe that we get access to. So uh, there will be questions like 
will the, um, the in, in, incredible open software for, which allows you to get uh, open courseware. Berners-Lee goes as far as to say that the web as we know it today could suddenly disappear in the future, where larger entities would put more clamps on the freedoms we currently enjoy. He said the public needed to be more aware of the possibility. On Thursday, the forum will focus more on how to tame the web and its many dangers, such as privacy and security breaches. The forum held in Seoul runs until Friday. Kim ji Arirang News. In recent weeks, we have seen sizable earthquakes around the world, and Korea was no exception. Our Shin se looks into whether the recent quakes in Korea could be linked to others throughout the world. A powerful magnitude 8.2 earthquake struck off the northern coast of Chile's Pacific coast on April 2nd, killing at least six people. In late March, also on the Pacific coast, Los Angeles was hit by a magnitude 5.1 earthquake, followed by more than a hundred aftershocks. A total of 31 earthquakes with a magnitude of six or higher have occurred worldwide this year, and 70 percent of them have taken place in Pacific coastal areas on the Ring of Fire, a horseshoe-shaped line that stretches around the Pacific coast. Experts say the recent quakes all share a common factor. Most earthquakes are due to forces that build up from past time quakes. So we can say that almost all earthquakes are interconnected in some way. For instance, the Chilean earthquake this month might have been influenced by powerful quakes in 1960. This same rule applies all the way across the Pacific to the Asian Pacific region. Japan is still in the stages of recovery from its 2011 Tohoku 9.0 earthquake, and Korea is not immune. The fourth strongest quake ever to hit the peninsula, a magnitude 5.1, struck on April 1st. Most people in Korea believe that the country is relatively safe from earthquake since it sits on the Eurasian plate away from borders with a lot of movement. However, experts say that people should take a closer look at Korea's history. Documents from the Joseon Dynasty of Korea, or the Annals of the Joseon Dynasty, note that from 1,413 to 1,865, more than 2,000 earthquakes, some in the magnitude 7 range, hit the Korean peninsula. Those historical records and the recent events clearly prove that although Korea sits on a comparably safe tectonic plate, no place on Earth is completely safe. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Some tragic news out of the Philippines. A South Korean student who went missing last month has been found dead. Korea's foreign ministry says the female college student in her mid-20s was kidnapped in Manila on March 3rd while on her way to meet a friend. Her body was found this week badly decomposed. The authorities have arrested one of her alleged abductors, but they believe at least three others remain at large. A total of four Korean nationals have been killed this year in the Philippines. And for more stories making headlines on the global front, we go live to Paul E. at the News Center. Paul, let's start with the worsening crisis in Ukraine. We hear the U.S. has accused Russia of orchestrating another Crimea-like intervention in eastern Ukraine. How far has a civil unrest escalated there? Well, a stark warning issued on Tuesday came after pro-Russian forces seized control of a government building in the city of Donetsk. Protesters also took over a security office in Luwask, holding 56 people hostage until they were released through tense negotiations. Against this backdrop, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry has suggested holding four-way talks with the EU, Russia and Ukraine. Our Kwan Sawa has the latest. With no immediate end to the Ukraine crisis in sight, senior officials from the EU, the US, Russia and Ukraine will try to find common ground in four-way talks next week, likely in Europe. It will represent the first such meeting since the crisis began. The talks were suggested by U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry as he accused Russian forces of stirring up separatist turmoil in the eastern part of Ukraine. He told Moscow to back down or face tougher new sanctions that would target Russia's banking, energy, mining and arms sectors. 
NATO Secretary General Anders Fogh Rasmussen warned Russia too, saying a further intervention in Ukraine would be a quote historic mistake and that it would lead to a further international isolation for Russia. The crisis worsened over the weekend when pro-Russian activists seized regional government buildings in three eastern Ukrainian cities. On Tuesday, Ukraine's interior ministry said it had detained some 70 people during an anti-terrorist operation in Kharkiv, but that protesters are still in control of a state security building in Luhansk. Protesters occupying a government building in Donetsk have declared a People's Republic of Donetsk and are planning a referendum to join the Russian Republic by May 11th. It's a potential powder keg, as the polarization of pro-Russians and pro-Ukrainians in the three cities is greater than it was in Crimea, which Russia annexed a month ago. Kwonsua, Arirang News. Certainly a deeply divided country. Let's hope diplomatic efforts can help de-escalate the tension there. Now, Paul, let's move on to some welcome news on that missing Malaysian airliner. The search team says they uh, detected new signals. Are we any closer to finding the wreckage? Officials say the two fresh underwater pings detected Tuesday are consistent with the Boeing 777's black box data recorder. Australian authorities heard the two separate signals once in the afternoon for five minutes, while the second transmission lasted seven minutes late last night. The new lead has injected fresh confidence into what has become an increasingly frustrating and costly search mission. We have no idea. I believe we are searching in the right area, but we need to visually identify aircraft wreckage before we can confirm with certainty that this is the final resting place of MH370. Search teams are racing against time as the batteries in the locator beacons have already reached their 30-day life expectancy. The black box may also provide crucial clues as to why and how Flight 370 vanished on March 8th while carrying 239 people. 15 military and civil aircraft took part in Wednesday's search mission. Right. And switching gears now to a massive vehicle recall issued by the Toyota Motor Company. Paul, how big is this recall? At nearly 6.5 million cars, it's the second largest recall in the Japanese auto giant's history. Toyota announced Wednesday that it will be recalling millions of its vehicles worldwide due to various defects, which were found in 27 models, including the RAV4 SUV and Yaris subcompact. Half of those vehicles, produced between April 2007 and December 2010, were found to have faulty steering wheels that could cause the airbag to fail in the event of a crash. The other half, which mainly affected three-door models produced between 2005 and 2010, were being recalled for defective seats that could slide forward in a collision. The world's biggest automaker said it was not aware of any crashes or injuries caused by the glitches. And before we let you go, Paul, what's the latest on the outbreak of Ebola virus in Western Africa? How long are we looking at before it can be contained? World Health Organization officials say it could take two to four months to completely halt the spread of the Ebola virus. But health officials say it's still spreading in three areas in southern Guinea from the capital of Conakry, with a total of 157 suspected cases and over 100 confirmed deaths. The United Nations agency said the outbreak was the most challenging ever to strike since the disease emerged four decades ago. So clearly in, in Guinea Forestier, the outbreak is not over. This is the epicenter of the outbreak and as long as this is not controlled there, there will be cases being exported from Guinea Forestier in the rest of the country and likely like it happened in Liberia in other countries. The WHO said some 50 international experts have been deployed to help with infection controls measures at local hospitals. Jie? All right, Paul, thank you very much for that update. We'll see you back in just about two hours.
Let's get the latest on the weather with our Kim Bogyang at the Weather Center. Bogyang, I hear the fine dust is back. What's the latest? Well, earlier today we got to see high levels of fine dust, but they are now back to normal. Taking a look at the current conditions, the nation will gradually be at the edge of a high-pressure system from the West Sea, which is why we're seeing clouds moving in over the central regions. Dry weather advisories continue mostly in the southern regions. In fact, humidity levels in Daegu have dipped to 11 percent. So please make sure to keep yourselves hydrated by drinking sufficient amounts of water. Otherwise. Those in Seoul and Gyeonggi-do province may get to see light passing sporadic showers overnight. Other than that, we will continue to enjoy more of this lovely spring weather before nationwide sprinkles fall over the weekend. Taking a look at tomorrow's readings, Seoul and Daegu make it to the low 20s, Gwangju jumps to 25, and Busan tops out at 19. Other regions such as Jeju peaks at 19 degrees, Dokdo and Mount Kumgang reach 11 and 8 degrees. Well, that's all the updates I have for you this hour, but I'll be back with more after 10. Thanks, Po Gyeong. And that brings us to the end of our newscast. I'm Yuji Hain Seoul. Join us again for more news updates on our primetime news at 10 p.m. Korea time. See you then.